Well, I want to begin uh, this morning with kind of an unusual question. Who do people down through the ages hate more than anyone else, a certain type of person? Now, there might be a, you know, some different kind of variations that come to your mind, but I would contend to you that men throughout the ages have hated traitors more than any other type of person. Because an enemy's attack could hurt you, right, from the outside, but a traitor's betrayal can destroy you from the inside. And throughout history, there have been many examples of traitors, right? A traitor will smile to your face, then stab you in the back, right? Or a traitor may offer to guard the gates of the city and then open it to the enemy. A traitor may proclaim his loyalty while secretly planning your demise and waiting for a good time to strike. There's different kinds of traitors, different kinds of betrayal, right? The one very kind of common form of betrayal is when someone betrays their country, right? A traitor to their country. But there is also other forms of betrayal. Um, there are those in this congregation who have experienced spousal betrayal when your own spouse betrays their sacred covenant of marriage and betrays you in the process. There's also the type of betrayal that happens amongst friends, right? When someone you thought was a friend turns on you and betrays a confidence or works against you secretly. Traitors are people who you thought were your friend. They thought you thought they were on your side. You thought they were allies when really they were secret enemies. And traitors have been universally despised throughout all of human history, but especially so in ancient times. Let me read you a few of these ancient quotes. 500 years before Christ, there was a Greek author, Aeschylus. He was called the father of the Greek tragedies, right? Those are the forms of plays which are kind of tragic plays. And he wrote this. He says, I have learned to hate all traitors, and there is no disease I spit on more than treachery. Then you have the Roman historian Tacitus who said, he who has no enemies is killed by his friends. Then you have Cicero speaking to the Roman Senate in 42 BC who said this, a nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious but it cannot survive treason from within. An enemy at the gates is less formidable, for he is known and carries his banner openly. But the traitor moves among those within the gate freely, his sly whispers rustling through all the alleys, heard in the very halls of government itself. For the traitor appears not a traitor. He speaks in the accents familiar to his victims, and he wears their face and their arguments. He appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of all men. He rots the soul of a nation. He works secretly and unknown in the night to undermine the pillars of the city. He infects the body politic so that it can no longer resist. A murderer is less to fear. The traitor is the plague." The ancient hatred of traitors was intense, but that hatred has continued into much more modern times. For example, for example, William Shakespeare wrote this. He says, though those that are betrayed do feel the treason sharply, yet the traitor stands in worse the case of woe. That was certainly the case with Judas Iscariot, right? I mean, here he is in the, one of the 12 disciples. He was even the one entrusted with carrying the money bag through which they were paying their expenses. And also, that, that was where money that they were collecting in order to help the poor was collected. And he was pilfering, it says, for that entire three years, he was pilfering money from that bag, literally stealing directly from Jesus Christ and directly from the poor. And then came his big chance to really cash in, and he betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But as William Shakespeare said, though those that are betrayed do feel the treason sharply, yet the traitor stands in the worst case of woe. That was true of Judas, right? The guilt he experienced was so intense that he goes out and he hangs himself, and then as his body is rotting and bloating there in the sun, the 
the rope or the branch breaks, his body falls to the ground, hits the ground, and bursts open with his intestines spilling on the ground as the Scriptures record. Traitors are hated more than anyone else because they utilize their victim's trust as their primary weapon. And so when traitors are unmasked and discovered, the consequences are usually very, very severe, often ending in death. But there's one other thing that I want you to know about this concept of treachery or being a traitor. Oftentimes throughout history, one side's traitor is the other side's hero. And whether or not a person is judged to be a hero or a traitor depends on what side of the conflict they choose. If someone betrays the side of goodness, of righteousness, of light, and of truth, they are considered to be despicable traitors like Judas Iscariot. But if they reject the side of darkness and of unrighteousness and of evil, and they give their lives for the cause of truth and of goodness and of righteousness and of light, they are considered heroes even if they switched sides in the process. So whether a person is a hero or a traitor depends on what side of the moral conflict they are on. I want you to consider, for example, this man, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He's a German citizen and theologian who was executed by the Nazis because of his involvement in a plot to get rid of Hitler. To the Nazis, he was a traitor, but to the rest of the world, he's remembered as a hero. Or consider this famous sketch by Norman Rockwell. This is depicting James Cheney and Michael Schwerner and Andrew Goodman, who were murdered by the KKK. And Norman Rockwell, who you probably more think of in terms of his paintings of the iconic American Thanksgiving dinner or some of those other iconic scenes of, of American life, he sketched this incredibly powerful scene of James, Michael, and Andrew, all young men in their early 20s, college students, who were being murdered in cold blood by the KKK. And why? Well, James was killed because he was a black man who dared to challenge the Mississippi white supremacists. But Michael and Andrew were killed because they were considered by the KKK to be white traitors. Why? Because they had gone down to Mississippi to help black people register to vote, and they had dared to visit a church which had been burned down by the KKK. So to the KKK, they were traitors. But in reality, as this incredible sketch by Norman Rockwell portrays, they were heroes. I want to talk to you a little bit today about another man, a man of the Bible who is considered by many to be a traitor, but who was indeed a hero. It's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a man who shocked both sides when he switched sides. And his testimony is recorded at his trial, a trial for treachery being a traitor to the Jewish cause, which is recorded in Acts chapter 22, verses 1 through 10. I want to read you his testimony given at a trial. He says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. When they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet, and he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons, as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. From them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. But it happened... That, I was on my, that as I was on my way, approaching Damascus about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus the Nazarene whom you are persecuting. 
And those who were with me saw the light to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up and go on into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. To some, this man was a traitor. He was Saul the traitor. But to others, he was Paul the apostle. Turn with me to Philippians 3, where we see his own testimony again of this incredible change of heart and allegiance which took place in his life. Philippians 3, beginning in verse 1, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Then he says something interesting. He says, beware of the dogs. There were those who were like bloodhounds, literally chasing him from city to city. He says, they're, they're like bloodhounds. I mean, they're just constantly nipping at my heels, following me around, seeking to strike. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is found in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ." More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. He switched sides. And his former allies, his former partners in crime that he had been persecuting the Christian church together with, those former allies now were his bitter enemies, like bloodhounds chasing him from place to place, trying over and over to put him to death because they considered him a traitor. And his former victims, the people who used to hide from him, now have been helping him hide. They've been lowering him over over city walls and baskets and risking their lives to whisk him out of cities just in the nick of time. The one who had formerly ordered their deaths was now facing death continually for their sake. This man whom his old enemies knew as Saul and his Christian friends knew now by his new name given to him by the Lord himself, Paul. This man had done both horrific things to Christians and then had horrific things done to him by his former friends because he had become a Christian. The Pharisees who were once friends now considered him a traitor and relentlessly pursued his death like bloodhounds. And Paul had been given a missionary commission from the Lord Jesus Christ, which was to spread the gospel through the world, and his missionary journeys kept him one step ahead of these foes. For many years, he had stayed one step ahead of them. But he had, along the way, experienced quite a few trials. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, where he gives us just a brief list of some of the examples of what he had experienced because he switched sides. He says in 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 22, he says, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so, in far more labors and far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches." Right? This is the type of regular, continuous, and intense suffering that was experienced by this man who is known to some as Saul the traitor and by others 
as Paul the Apostle. Now, I want you to turn to Ephesians 3. We're going to pick up where we left off in our study of Ephesians. And in chapter 3, we're meeting Paul as he's now writing to the primarily Gentile church in Ephesus and in the regions around it. And as he writes this letter, to remind you, he is chained to a Roman guard. He is under house arrest in Rome awaiting trial. And he has been imprisoned now. He has been not free. He's been in chains now for four years when he writes these words. He had been arrested in Jerusalem and had spent four years in prisons as his case slowly wound its way through the Roman Empire's appeal system. Look on the screen with me as we read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. It says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. See if I can get the slide to advance for you there. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory." Now, there is a lot of information in these verses, but there is a common theme throughout all of them. And that theme is that God had revealed a glorious mystery to Paul and to the other apostles and prophets, but primarily through the Apostle Paul, who becomes the one who writes the majority of the New Testament. And that mystery was that God was grafting the Jews and the Gentiles together into a new body, the church. A new body something previously unrevealed, and it is the church itself which is that mystery, previously un unrevealed, now revealed through the holy prophets and apostles. Now, that may sound at first just kind of as a theological statement. God is grafting the Jews and Gentiles together into one body of the church. But if you were living in the first century, you would have found this to be absolutely world-changing and life-changing and daily habits changing. Don't forget that in the first century, a Jew and a Gentile couldn't talk to each other. They couldn't eat together. What they could eat was regulated, when they could eat it, with whom they could eat it, where you could walk, where you couldn't walk, who you could talk to, who you couldn't talk to, all of these things were highly regulated by this barrier between Jew and Gentile. It affected every aspect of their lives, every aspect of the culture, and the mystery which God reveals to Paul literally upended the whole world. It upended cultures and societies and empires. It was a previously unrevealed mystery and when God revealed it to Paul and to the other apostles and prophets, it literally changed the world and changed people's lives. This mystery became a spiritual revolution in which millions of people switched sides from the kingdom of Satan and of darkness to the kingdom of light, from following demonically inspired pagan religions to following the Lord Jesus Christ and gathering in local assemblies called churches. 
And in chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, we're going to see five key aspects of this theme through Paul's understanding of the mission that Christ had given him. We're going to see, first of all, Paul's commission for the Gentiles, and then Paul's revelation for the Gentiles, his message for the Gentiles, his purpose for the Gentiles, and his suffering for the Gentiles. And notice that all of those have a common theme. It's all things done for the Gentiles, for their sake. His commission, his revelation, his message, his purpose, and his suffering were all for the Gentiles. So look with me at verses 1 through 2, and we're going to see Paul's commission for the Gentiles. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, now listen, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me, and notice again, for you, for you. Paul is reminding the Ephesian believers that he's been in prison for four years. And the reason he's been in prison for four years is because he defied the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and the Judaizers, and he ministered to their hated enemies, the Gentiles. And for the Ephesians, he's not just making kind of a general statement. Hey, you know, I'm in prison because I kind of ministered to the Gentiles. He makes it very specific. He emphasizes, I am in prison for the sake of you Gentiles. He's being very direct to the Ephesians. Why? Why is he being so direct to the Ephesians? It's because of the reason of his arrest four years earlier. Paul had been arrested because he was seen in Jerusalem with Trophimus the Ephesian, a man from Ephesus named Trophimus. It was his fellowship with an Ephesian Gentile believer that led to his arrest in the first place. And it, will, it was Jews from Asia Minor, from the region that Ephesus is in, who actually made the accusation against him. So both the reason he was accused and his accusers were all from the region of Asia Minor where Ephesus was. In fact, the reason that Paul calls these people bloodhounds in Philippians is because they had followed him from Asia Minor to Jerusalem, and it was there that they sprang. They saw their opportunity, and they struck. And he's been in prison now for four years because of it. Both his accusers and the Gentile believer the accusation centered on were both from Asia Minor. And I think that the ones who made the accusation they somehow were able to recognize Trophimus in a crowd of people. It's likely they may have even knew him personally, Trophimus the Ephesian. Look at Acts 21. I read from Acts 22, which is his defense. Turn a little earlier to Acts 21, verse 27 where we read this record of his arrest. It says, when the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, right? So it's from this region where Ephesus is in. The Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Look at verse 29. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was provoked, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. And while they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander of the Roman court that all Jerusalem was in confusion. At once, he took along some soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. All right, did you catch what was said in that passage? His accusers were from Asia Minor, and it was because they had seen him in the city with Trophimus, the Ephesians the Ephesian. They'd been hunting him down for years. They'd followed him. 
from Asia Minor to Jerusalem, and now they saw their opportunity to strike. So Paul's now been in prison for four years because of that event. And so when Paul writes to Ephesians that he is a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, he's being very specific. I am in prison because of you. Because I ministered to you. Because I was your friend. Because I walked in Jerusalem with you and I wasn't ashamed to call Gentiles my brothers. All he had to do to avoid this fate was just to turn his back on his Gentile Christian brethren. Just say, hey, you know what? Let's let the Gentile Christians have their churches and let the Jewish Christians have their churches. Peter was tempted in that way. But Paul says, no, these are my brothers. I'm not going to be ashamed to be seen in fellowship with my brothers in Christ. You know, when I first read these words, I, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, kind of sounded like a guilt trip to me. Hey, you're the reason I've been in jail for four years. You're the reason I've been rotting in prison. But notice what he says. He says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. He doesn't say, I'm a prisoner of the Asian Jews, even though they were the ones who brought the charges against him. He doesn't say, I'm the prisoner of Rome, even though the Romans were the one who arrested him and in whose charge they were, whose prisons he had been in. He says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. In other words, what bound him was not the Asian Jews or the Romans. It was his commission given by the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember what Paul had said to the Ephesian elders when he said the goodbye to them for the last time? He's on his way to Jerusalem, and he says, look, I know the Holy Spirit testifies with me that chains await me. I know what's going to happen. And he says, but I don't count my life as being dear to myself so that I can fulfill the task which Jesus gave me. I'm not going to count my life as being dear and hold on to it. I'm going to give it for the commission I've been given by Christ. Acts 21 verses 10 through 15 says that even on his way, there were prophets who came and said, look, you're going to be bound in Jerusalem. You're going to, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to leave there in chains. And Paul responds by saying, if that's the will of the Lord, so be it. And he goes on to Jerusalem. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, Paul writes, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Right? My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. You see, Paul understood that his circumstances were connected to his commission. In fact, his circumstances were just the means that Christ had ordained for him to fulfill his commission. That arrest in Jerusalem had given him amazing opportunities. First, he got to preach to that whole crowd right there in Jerusalem. Then he got to preach before kings. He got to preach all along the way in this, this route. When he was shipwrecked, he got to preach to people on an island. I mean, the whole journey, that whole four years had been filled with gospel opportunities. And it had brought him to Rome, the very heart of the empire that dominated that world. And because of that imprisonment, he had been able to spread the gospel in a way which could have never happened if he had not been arrested. So let me ask you this. Do you see your circumstances that way? Do you see the connection between your circumstances and your commission? 
right? Like Paul, we've been given a commission by Christ. Go and make disciples, right? Preach the gospel to the whole world. And our circumstances are merely the context in which our commission is being implemented. God has placed you in a specific circumstance to fulfill a certain commission. Have you lost your job? You're probably standing in unemployment lines with other people who have lost their jobs and who are desperately wondering what their future holds. What an opportunity. Are you sick in the hospital? Your circumstance is a context for the fulfillment of your commission. Do you view even your suffering as the means God is using to sanctify you for your good and to use you to proclaim the gospel of salvation to the lost? Your suffering is not just a trial, it is an opportunity. And we must learn to turn our temporary trials into eternal triumphs. But to do so, we have to be able to see, as Paul did, the connection between his circumstances and his commission. And we, if we make that connection, we'll turn our focus from inward to outward and upward. We'll turn our focus away from ourselves and on to those that the Lord has now positioned us through our circumstances to minister to, right? Paul says in our passage, he says, I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. There's, I'm a prisoner. There's my circumstance. Now here's my commission. For the sake of you Gentiles. Look with me next at Paul's revelation for the Gentiles. We saw his commission for the Gentiles. Now his revelation, verses 3 through 5. It says, By revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote it before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Now, there had been numerous hints in the Old Testament about what God was going to do. The new covenant was revealed in the Old, uh, in the Old Testament. There were many prophecies that Messiah was going to come and bring salvation there was revelation that through Abraham all the nations of the world would be blessed. But what was a mystery, what hadn't been revealed, was the church. The church. And now, Paul is referring back to, to chapter 2, verse 20, which we talked about last week, where the church has been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. He's saying, look, God has revealed this mystery of the church, what it is and what it's supposed to do and, and who its Lord is and how we're supposed to relate to him and to each other. This has been revealed to the holy prophets and apostles and to me, even though I was the least of all saints, verse 8. He's reminding the Ephesians that what he had taught them were not just human words. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit, divine revelation which God had given to them through the apostles and prophets, the foundation of the church. He had a commission to reach the Gentiles, and then he'd been given revelation from God to pass on to them. So let's look then at verses 6 through 9 and see the specific content of that revelation. Verses 6 through 9, he says, To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power, right? I'm in prison because I preached the Gentiles, and what a privilege that's been. What a grace that's been, he says. Verse 8, to me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. He had a message to give to the Gentiles. And I want you to focus on the repetition of the word fellow in verse 6. To be specific, the Gentiles are fellow heirs 
and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That word in the NAS, fellow, is a translation of the Greek prefix soon, which we talked about last week, right? Because it appeared multiple times in verses 19 through 22 of chapter 2. And Paul is using this prefix again, this prefix which means to be together or with or fellow or equal. And he's saying the Gentiles are equal heirs and equal members of the body and equal partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Fellow heirs, fellow partakers, fellow members of the body. He's emphasizing again, just like he did at the end of chapter 2, that Gentile Christians have full access to God and are absolutely on an equal plane to Jewish Christians. And so now we ask, what's the significance of this for us? You know, as I thought about this, you think about that world in that day and how, from the Greek perspective, you had Greeks here and then this lower class people, the Jews down here, or then from the Jewish perspective, you had the Jewish people up here and the Gentiles down here, two classes of people with different privileges and all of that. I think the takeaway for us is a reminder that in the church there are no first class and second class people. There's no caste system in the church. There are no haves and have nots the super spiritual, the enlightened, and the unenlightened. Unlike many religious groups, there is not some substantive distinction between the clergy who are super spiritual and everyone else. God hasn't given one group of Christians a full gospel and then given others only a partial gospel. He hasn't baptized some Christians in the Holy Spirit while leaving others unbaptized in the Holy Spirit and therefore devoid of the Spirit's power in their life. He hasn't given some of his people some kind of secret form of prayer which gives them mystical access into deeper levels of his presence than other Christians have. He hasn't given some of his people a second work of grace which elevates them to entire sanctification or some sort of a deeper life while leaving others out. He has given of his fullness to all believers. Boyce puts it well. He says, these uses of the words embrace all that a person receives or will receive in salvation. It is the whole of God's blessing, possessed jointly by all believers in Christ. So there is no inner circle or outer circle of the saved. The Jews are not first-rate Christians and the Gentiles second-rate Christians, or vice versa. All who are in Christ inherit all of God's blessings, and they inherit them, they inherit them jointly. They have it together in the one body of Jesus Christ. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones adds as well, he says, We are all equally sinners, equally helpless, We have all come to the one and the same Savior. We have the same salvation. We have the same Holy Spirit. We have the same Father. We even have the same trials. And we are all marching and going together to the same eternal home. There is equality before the cross of Christ. That's why Peter could look at all believers and say, you have received a faith of the same kind as ours. And then he goes on to say, and you have been given everything you need for life and godliness according to the true knowledge of Christ. So practically, when some speaker or a friend or an author that you encounter comes around telling you that you're missing something because all you have is the Bible and prayer in the church, and they can give you some sort of secret method or secret you know, some sort of super secret, you know, spiritual means of boosting you to some higher level. Be Bereans. Be Bereans. There are not gurus out there that can lift you up to a higher plane. Paul says in verses 4 through 5 of our mystery, that, uh, of our passage, that the mystery has now been revealed The mystery of Christ has now been revealed. 
He uses this word mystery, which is mysterion in Greek, and it's a word which was already gaining popularity in certain circles that we call the proto-Gnostics, which became later on, about a century later, full-blown Gnosticism. And the Gnostics were people who believed that there were these entirely separate categories of spiritual enlightenment. And you needed a guru to take you from the normal level that the common guy has to these enlightened levels of higher and deeper knowledge of the divine. Paul uses that word and he says, the mystery has now been revealed. There's not these unlocked secrets, you know, like video game stuff, you have a secret power up that gets you to a higher level. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. If you want someone to let you into the highest and deepest spiritual mysteries, turn to the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. So he's telling the Ephesians, when the Gnostics come knocking, turn away. He's telling you, when the neo-Gnostics come knocking, turn away. Don't be deceived by their claim to possess keys to unknown spiritual mysteries. If it wasn't revealed to the holy apostles and prophets, trust me, it wasn't revealed to them. Everything you need to know about Christ has already been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets and recorded for you to access and for every believer to access in his word. One of the things I love about the Bible is it levels the playing field. It levels the playing field. You can take in your hands and read the very words of God. No one stands in between you and him. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the true knowledge of him. Fourth, look at verses 10 through 12, where we see Paul's purpose for the Gentiles, or maybe better stated, God's purpose for the Gentile church. Verses 10 through 12. Here's the purpose clause, so that, here's that purpose, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. All right, notice again, we have boldness and confident access, everybody, right? But here's this eternal purpose. Verse 10, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known, and here's the means, through the church. Through the church. And to whom? To the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Last Sunday night I taught on the topic of angels and demons, and we studied many texts which very clearly indicate that angels are very aware of what's going on here And verse 10 was one of those examples. Angels marvel at God's wisdom when they see him transforming rebel sinners into members of God's family. They marvel at it. How can it be? From the perspective of the holy angels, sinners are spiritual rebels. They they are those who betrayed God and joined the kingdom of darkness. And now God in grace is rescuing these traitors and redeeming them and making them sons and daughters. They just marvel at this, at God's wisdom and his grace. Paul wanted the Ephesian church to know that what they do and how they live is important not only to the people all around them, but it's important to the angelic hosts. Through the church, Paul says, the manifold wisdom of God is made known to the angelic hosts. Do you understand that? Do you realize that what's happening here is manifesting God's wisdom to the angelic hosts? It's truly an amazing thought, right? I mean, these little churches in the area of Ephesus where this circular letter was sent, they were manifesting God's wisdom to the angelic hosts. That church in the western part of Congo is manifesting God's glory, not only to men, but to angels. 
And that is happening here on Drake Road as well. It's an incredible privilege and a responsibility that we have, right? It's part of being that holy temple in the Lord that we talked about in previous weeks. Fifth, let's look at Paul's suffering for the Gentiles. Paul's suffering for the Gentiles. Paul ends where he began in verse 1, right? He began in verse 1 by saying he was a prisoner of Christ for the sake of you Gentiles. And now he returns to that thought in verse 13. He says, therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. He's reminding them again, look, it is true. I've been in prison now for four years because of my love for you, because I preached the gospel to you, because I wasn't ashamed to call an Ephesian believer my brother and walk down the streets of Jerusalem with him. Yes, I am experiencing tribulations, and those tribulations are on your behalf. But he says, don't lose heart over that. Don't lose heart. Don't be discouraged. Don't feel bad. Think about Trophimus. Can you imagine if you were him? You walk down the streets of Jerusalem with Paul, brothers, friends, then your friend, your brother, is arrested because he was seen with you. And now for four years, Paul has been experiencing all of these tribulations. Paul says, don't lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf. And he says, why? For they are your glory, right? And he says, th- he, he connects what he says in verse 13 to what he had just said. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart. They're your glory. He's saying, look, it is a glorious thing that through what is happening, God's manifold wisdom is being displayed. So don't feel bad about it. Don't lose heart over it because God's purposes are being fulfilled and we're having this incredible privilege of radiating and manifesting God's glory to the world and to the angels. Paul is reflecting back on Acts chapter 22, verses 18 through 23. I had read the first part of his defense at the beginning of the message. I want to read this one now. He gets to the end of his defense to that mob in Jerusalem, and he says, I saw Jesus saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. I mean, Paul's fist had hit Christian faces. He says, verse 20, when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I also was standing by approving, cheering him on, watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. Then verse 21, and he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Verse 22 says, that mob listened to him up to this statement, and then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. Take him in and torture him until he tells us what's going on. All of this, Paul says, don't lose heart over it. Don't lose heart over my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. We had talked in previous weeks about how the church is a living temple, a dwelling of God in the Spirit. He's saying, look, there's glory here in this suffering. Don't see chains. See the glory of God. My tribulations are your glory. God is using everything that's happening to accomplish His eternal plan And in the end, we will all realize that our light and momentary afflictions are producing, as Paul said in another place, an eternal weight of glory which far outweighs them all. 
In other words, when we get to eternity, we're going to take all of our trials and all of our sufferings and put them on a scale, and then all of the glory that has been revealed through those trials and sufferings, and the glory is going to far outweigh them all. So I want to close by asking you three questions. Number one, do you, as Paul did, consider it a grace, a gift from God to have the privilege of preaching the gospel? And especially to preach the gospel to those that hate you, that are your enemies. Number two, do you love the lost enough to suffer for their sake? Can anyone say that you suffered for them because you loved them? Number three, are you willing to be a traitor to the world in order to be a loyal servant to Jesus Christ? Oftentimes, What holds people back is that their family, their society, those who are close to them are subtly saying, don't betray us by coming, by becoming one of those Jesus freaks. Don't betray us. But are you willing to be a traitor to the world in order to be a loyal servant of Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Lord, how grateful we are that Paul was faithful to his commission as an apostle to the Gentiles, Lord, because the vast majority of us in this room are Gentiles, and we wouldn't even be here today, Lord, if it wasn't for the sacrifice made. Not only by Paul, but by the many missionaries who carried the gospel to our lands, Lord, who came to our idol-worshiping demon-worshiping ancestors and preach the gospel often at the cost of their own lives. Lord, how grateful we are for the grace which we've received through the grace you gave to them to be heralds of the gospel. Lord, may we be that as well. May we have feet which are swift to share the good news. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.